Greetings, I hope and trust. I find you all, my dear friends, and welcome to the eighth installment where we're looking at the series Managing for the Master Till He Comes, and the subtopic for this week is Planning for Success. As we're looking at planning for success, it is needful that we look at the foregone conclusion. When you're planning for success, the first thing you need to do is plan. And in these plans, you're going to have your objectives, you'll have your goals, you'll have your vision, you'll have your mission, and you'll have your strategic plan. All these are plans, basically. All these are plans. When you've gone through all these plans, you also need to acquire the requisite skill. That's the second thing you need to do. When you've acquired that requisite skill, the third thing you need to succeed is to ensure that you have the right attitude. It's not always about aptitude, but attitude gets you farther. Before we go into this study, why don't we bow our heads and invite the Lord's presence. Let us pray together. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, dear Lord, we want to succeed both in this life and be successful for the life to come. Tabernacle with us as we go through this study. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, Amen. Having advanced that uh, it is necessary for us to have the right attitude, besides the aptitude, of course. Let's look at this attitude and how do we get to this attitude. Our memory text gets us right through that door. Colossians 3, verse 23 to 24. In the King James Version, the New King James Version provides as follows. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to man knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. Later on, we're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 on doing everything that your hand finds to do with all your might. Now, when Paul writes to the church in Colossians, he says, whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it with a positive attitude. Why should you do it with a positive attitude? Because you appreciate that you do not operate under fellow man, but you operate under God. You are doing it not to man, but you are doing it knowing that the Lord will give you the reward. So when we are out there, how do we begin to succeed? We need as Christians to come up with a higher standard. Our standards cannot be the ones that are set up by fellow men. Our standards cannot be the ones that are set up by the local regulatory authorities. Our standards have to be higher than those. So for any Christian who say, these people are on my case, they're giving me grief. They're always out to pick errors. They're always out to get me on the wrong. My friend, you are working way below par. That means your standard is at the level of fellow man. Your standard ought to be above that of fellow man. Go to the book of Daniel chapter 6. You know, the, 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 these satraps, the princes and the core governors, have sought to catch Daniel in the wrong, and they fail to do so. And what do they say? There is no way we can catch this man except in matters of his God and the law. And they go on to seek to have an edict put in place so that those who pray are going to be arrested. And they caught him. They caught him in that aspect. But the issue we need to keep alive at the back of our minds is that when we operate above the standards of man and we operate as per the standards of God, we become beyond reproach. So this is the attitude. This is the attitude that already sets us on the plan to succeed. We need to operate above the standards of fellow man. Have a higher standard. Have a higher standard. That is non-negotiable. So even if we're going to go there and start complaining and saying, you know, the, the, the environment is not fair, the environment, the, 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 the playing field is not level. Remember, Daniel was a slave. Daniel was a foreigner. How uneven can it get? And in matters of success, some of us would uh, say maybe it uh, relates to those who are already uh, in um, places of vantage, um, placing like Daniel who was already a prime minister of some sort. No, my friends. In matters of life, there are some things we cannot run away from. We all need money. We all need success. These are realities of life while we're still on earth. It is not evil to seek to succeed. It is not evil. It is godly, actually, because God actually gives us how we can do this in his word. 
And for us to succeed, first things first. The wise man in Ecclesiastes 12 verses 1 says to the young man, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. This is uh, usually a text that we have used to appeal to young folk to give their lives to the Lord. But as a matter of success, what lesson are we getting out of this? The issue that uh, Solomon wants us to appreciate using modern lingo is that we need to have a high moral ethical ground. You know, actually people now go to school. They, 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 they do studies like in um, business ethics, uh, professional ethics, religious, religion and ethics. Why are we doing these? These are derived from Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1. So that in the days of our youth, we can have that moral foundation. It is based on this morality that most companies are thriving. Most economies are thriving. When you look at uh, the scale that measures corruption, you know, there's an index. I'll, I'll not say uh, where some of these countries uh, that we hail from rate on the, uh, on the moral scale. That moral scale is basically impacted by the ethical conduct. So where you have high ethical standards, you're going to find that you're already on a pathway to succeed, both as a nation, as a corporate, and as an individual. So Paul say, I mean, uh, apologies, uh, Solomon actually says, you need to ensure that in the days of your youth, you have that moral and ethical grounding. And Solicit does offer these courses, both at undergrad and at, you know, at postgrad level. There will always be courses on ethics, ethical behavior. Regardless of whatever profession you're doing, it is just urged in there. And the reason is very simple. You need it as a pillar to succeed. It's a stepping stone to your success, moral and ethical grounding. Let's look at the other thing that you also want to look at. We have looked at a positive attitude. We have looked at moral and ethical grounding. There is the other thing that is indispensable that you cannot avoid. Hmm. A work culture. A work culture. You know, we have people, uh, is it um, Shakespeare who says some of us are born with a silver spoon stuck in our mouths. There are some people who have endowment funds uh, that have been set up for them. Trust funds are they. They don't need to work in their whole life. But uh, this may not be the story for most of us. Some of us need to earn a living. Some of us need to work in order to meet the demands of survival in this life that we're in. So when we get to issues of working, what then should we appreciate? Uh, I, I did mention this. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the verse is 10. What does it provide as in the King James Version? Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy mind. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. What should we then appreciate? That, you know, number one, we are called to work. Um, it, it, Pastor Nehemiah Piri did mention, he posted something interesting on, uh, on, on Facebook. He says, this principle of I receive, I receive without uh, getting down to work is not biblical and it doesn't work. We need to get our hands dirty. We need to roll up our sleeves and work. And whatever work that we are to do, we are to do it with all our might. And later on, we're going to be looking at uh, Jacob and Joseph and how they executed the work that was assigned to them. But here's the other thing that I want us to appreciate. As we do everything in our might, the, the, the Bible says there is no work in the grave where thou goest. It is either you're going to get to a time when you can work no more because you are dead or you can work no more because you have retired. So our work is limited to about 40 years of work. Having done something like 18 years in HR, what I, I, I noticed is um, most of us, we do not prepare very well for retirement. And as retirement knocks at the door, you, you find people most frustrated because they did not prepare very well. They actually planned to work forever until Jesus comes. But this is not true. This is not realistic. You cannot be 65 years old and expect to work as agile and effective as a 25-year-old. Technology will see you out. 
industrial advancement will see you out. Even energy itself will rule you out. So you need to appreciate there shall come a time when you are not going to be as agile, energetic, and as creative as you used to be. I'm beginning to realize it even now. At times I feel like I'm still young. I can still do this. But you can feel that, no, 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 no. You're not what you were 17 years ago when you started working. You know, things are becoming slower. Things are becoming much harder. So when Solomon says, work with all your might. But remember, this work has a limit. So if you are to succeed, you succeed within the set period. You succeed within the 40 years. How do you then begin to succeed? When you are in the first phase of your work, you want to make sure you are acquiring skill. When you are in the last phase of your work, you want to make sure you are consolidating what you have and making savings for a time when you are not going to work and have that income. If you do it that way, you're definitely going to succeed. That is basic HR. Basic HR. Now, let us look at the other thing that you also want to appreciate about uh, succeeding. You, 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 you work if you have been blessed with a family uh, for your children, basically. You want to make sure that by the time you leave them, they are secure. And uh, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 makes this clear. What is the standard? What is the standard? But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Before we look at the extended family, when we do not invest for our children, for our spouses, when we die, when we die, we die like unbelievers because we have failed to provide for our literal on. You don't necessarily need to start ex providing for the extended family, providing for the church, before you amen, provide for your own. Failure to do so, failure to provide for your own, is something that makes you equivalent to an infidel. Why? Because you leave the church with a burden. Why? Because you leave the extended family with a burden. You need to plan for your children. These are some of the areas where these things will be done. What are the key performance areas? Provide a Christian home environment for your children. Do not leave your children being um, rascals of some sort. You know, there's no one who would really want to take over the responsibility of uh, looking up after your children. Because whatever they pick is gone and is sold. So you want to make sure that your children are the model citizens. Provide that enabling environment. And how do you do that? Constant prayer with them. Let them be children who are studious and students of the word. And uh, of course, of course, you also need to teach them the value of work. You know, you, you cannot have a scenario whereby our children are always going to believe there will be help in the home. They may find themselves after you are gone, where they'll have to do these things for themselves. Provide the training. If you do not do it, you're like an infidel, not just money-wise. You are like an infidel. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, Proverbs says, he will not depart from it. Do they even know how to clean? Do they know how to cook? Train your children at a very young age so that they can be able to do this. And then, of course, provide a good education for your children. This is going to be expensive. It's, it's not going to come in cheap, especially if you're thinking of sending your children into private um, education. Uh, education. And... Um, Amongst these seven day Adventist school, um, schools are not quite um, affordable. They're not within the range for some people. But you need to plan for the education of your children. When you give them good education, you give them grounding. Once they have that, here's the advantage. They are in a position to access certain opportunities. They're in an op a position to take some core curricular studies that are not in public education. And thereafter, they are able to get new career paths. So you need to plan well for this. And of course, of course, even though uh, it, it might be a touchy subject, do family planning. The more children you have, the more expenses you're going to have. The, the, this follows. So if you're going to have five of them and you want to send them to university, you're going to get to a point where three of your children, one is a freshman, other is a sophomore, the other is a senior. How are you going to meet that university bill? So let's think about those things. Let's think about those things. If you fail to do that, you're like an infidel. 
So it, it goes broader, it goes wider, it goes wider. You, can, you cannot run away from this responsibility. And uh, here's the last thing we want to look at. What does the Bible say about succeeding? It gives us a counsel on uh, how to go about this. And before we go into this counsel on how to go about this, I, I want us to go back to a positive attitude. A positive attitude. You, you know, there, there, there are some people who are quick to say, the place where I operate is toxic. Therefore, I will not perform. I will not do what is expected of me. Of course, but they, they, they always draw the salary. <laughs> that one is a constant. They draw the salary, but they don't want to perform. Because they, they're saying the environment is toxic. So because the environment is toxic, does it mean one is then justified not to perform? One is justified to underperform? And of course, when you come to the Sabbath, you then want to tell people you are an Adventist, you cannot be at work? What happens from Monday to Friday? Are you really that worker who shows that you have a good attitude? You have a, 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 a mean moral grounding, an ethical grounding, and you have the value of work in you. Now let's look at uh, these two characters in brief and in passing. Jacob has fled from his brother Esau. So he's a fugitive. And he domiciles with Laban. While he's there, Laban takes advantage of his nephew. Number one, cheats him when it comes to marriage. Number two, he makes him work for him. And while he's working, the herd begins to increase and he wants to swap it. And, you know, there is no peace there. But here's the thing that uh, Laban says when Jacob is about to leave and he says, now I need to go back. Go back to my people with my family. Laban actually confesses that no, the Lord is with you. And because the Lord is with you, he has blessed you and my provisions have increased. Tarry with me. If you were to work for an opportunist, someone who is taking advantage of you, while they are at it taking advantage of you, will they see the Lord in your work? That's the challenge I want to place to you. When you are being taken advantage of and you are being tossed from pillar to post, can people still see God in your work? And then secondly, you also want to look at Joseph. You know, the brother issue. One is running away from the brother and the other is sold by the brothers into captivity. He is now in the house of Potiphar, where he is a slave. He does not have many rights or any rights at all. But he distinguishes himself as a person who is led by the Holy Spirit. And Potiphar, whom I believe is an unbeliever. And the same may, be, may have been true of Laban because he had gods. Now, Potiphar acknowledges that, you know, the way the Lord was with Joseph led to the increase in his holding until he promoted Joseph. Now, Potiphar is a slave driver, a slave master. Even though he is promoted, he's a promoted slave. And some would say he was not free in any case. He was just uh, an extension of the slave master. But that aside, that aside, even if you're working in deplorable conditions, are you worth promoting? Those who are driving you like a slave, will they say at the end of the day, the Lord was with Joseph? The Lord is with MK. Even though we're victimizing him, the Lord is with him. So how do we then succeed? You know, what we employ is skill. What we promote is work attitude and work ethic. That's what we promote. So when you get to Jacob and you look at Joseph as well, what is promotable in their conduct is the work ethic. Those who are there and next to them just have to realize that you need not open your Bible to evangelize. If you are in a workspace, if you are in service delivery, people must say, this man is with the Lord. This woman is with the Lord. And how many of us can get that kind of an accolade? Now, let's look at um, God's counsel. Seven issues are raised, and I'm going to mention them in passing here. And uh, this is counsel. Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. What is the first thing you need to do in order to succeed? Number one, develop a spending plan. Financial. 
financially. Develop a spending plan. Don't just say, when I get money, I'll figure out what to do with it. Go out to get money so that you can do something that you've already known what you ought to do. Look at Proverbs 27, verse 23. And then when you have that money, when you have the money, point number two, spend less than you have earned. Determine to live within your means. This is Proverbs 15, verse 16. A scenario whereby you have more of the month at the end of the pay and less of the pay at the end of the month is not the way to go. So by the time you get to the next paycheck, you must still be spending money from the previous paycheck. You must be spending money from the previous paycheck. And um, number three, which is uh, an amplification of number two, you also want to save a portion from every pay period. I've already mentioned this in, pub, in passing. You know, there, there, there is actually a scale that is given in HR metrics where at the beginning you are saving up to 20% of your income. About maybe 20% or so, increase that to 40% of your income. And then when you are on the tail end now moving towards retirement, you flip that. You're now saving 60% and you're spending 40%. Why do you need to do this? so that you can be financially liquid as you go further down. So, and uh, this part about saving, you're going to find it in Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 8. And then mask up against debt. Avoid COVID like your debt. And avoid your debt like COVID. Both ways. Mask up. COVID has resurfaced. Let's remember to mask up. And as far as your life is concerned, you make sure that you stay away from debt as much as possible. We have looked at this, Proverbs 22, verse 7. What happens is that the one who is the borrower is the slave to the rich man. You don't want to be in that position. You will never be your own man. And at number five, be a diligent worker. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. And Paul says, whosoever does not work should not eat. Diligence. We cannot pray for everything, but we can pray over everything. There are some things that you cannot pray for. Work is one of those. You have to do it. You cannot pray for things to happen. You do them. When you now have a job that you prayed for, you can't continue to pray at work. Now it's time to work. Do the work. Do the work. And then in order to appreciate that all things come from God and from his right hand. You need to be financially faithful to God. Return those tithes and give an offering. What does this do? We've already covered this. It brings God into a partnership with us. In fact, it takes us into a partnership with God. And when God is the one who is our co-laborer, we can never be in want. We are always going to achieve and we are going to excel. And above all, let your minds not just be trained on things beneath, Lift up your eyes, for your redemption cometh from the eastern side. Let us have our minds on the heavenly. Let's not just look at success in the earth space and down here. If we are to go into, if we are going to success down here, to succeed down here and lose everything in the kingdom to come, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So let us remember that our greatest success is to meet the master on the day of reckoning and give an account and say, Lord, I had one talent. I made them two. I had two. I made them four. I had five. I made them ten. Our talents on this earth and how they are expended is a reflection of what shall become of us as we seek to access the kingdom to come. If you have not looked at unto the list of these, I'll recommend that you look at the previous installment and appreciate that when you use these talents, we are to grow them for the master and we are to be ambassadors for the kingdom. My dear friends, I hope you have benefited from the study. May the Lord prosper you and succeed in the spaces and endeavors that you have gone into. May he lead, guide, and protect and above all, increase your spheres of influence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.